In chapter 10, we're going to be looking at gases. We'll be looking at properties of gases and the gas laws. Uh, so this is an important chapter to build on. Uh, just as a note, we do chapter 10 before we do chapter 5. Uh, that may seem a little bit unusual, but it turns out that chapter 5 and chapter 10 go well together. And, uh, and then chapter 6 and 7 go well together. So that's, that's why we end up doing it in this order. So, without further ado, let's look at chapter 10. All right, well, we first want to start with the characteristics of gases. Uh, gases will behave in a very similar fashion physically. Now, chemically, they can be quite different, but physically, uh, they're going to have similar chem or physical properties. That is, they're going to flow easily. They will diffuse rapidly, and that's just because the molecules move around quite easily. Um, they will expand to fill their containers, and they are highly compressible. And uh, the reason for, for this is that there is lots of empty space in between the molecules. We'll also find that they typically have pretty low densities compared to things like liquids and solids. All right. And we'll, we'll find that uh, uh, most of our gases are going to be nonmetals, but there are some interesting exceptions to this that we'll talk about a little bit later in this chapter uh, um, where we have some metals that ends up being gases, uh, metals, compounds, that is, that end up being gases. All right. Uh, oh, and then anytime you have two or more gases, they will be a homogeneous mixture. Uh, we'll find that, that gases will mix spontaneously, and uh, there's a reason behind that. It has to do with the second law of thermodynamics, but we'll save that for a later point in your life. All right. Well, uh, these are just a few common gases, and I, I, I like to point these out just to, to show that there is a wide variety of chemical properties for the gases. Uh, we have several up top that are extremely deadly. Uh, HCN, uh, uh, very, very deadly. Um, it, it does have the uh, slight odor of bitter almonds, but uh, uh, if you smell the bitter almonds, it's all over. So. Uh, H2S, you're probably familiar with that one because that's the odor of rotten eggs. Uh, it is very toxic at high concentrations. Carbon monoxide, hopefully you know about that one being extremely toxic. Carbon dioxide, it is colorless and I would say mostly odorless. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a little bit of a odor to it if you count the fact that it you know it's a little bit acidic and so if you breathe it in it it does convert a little bit of the moisture in your nose into uh, uh, carbonic acid and so it does have kind of a an odor or flavor to it but not very significant methane colorless odorless quite flammable ethylene uh, also flammable Let's see, propane, there's another flammable. Nitrous oxide, this is the one that's used as laughing gas. Nitrogen dioxide, toxic red, not laughing gas. Uh, uh, it's a red-brown color, not laughing gas. Uh, very, very deadly. Uh, ammonia uh, has a very pungent odor. Uh, you, you've used that around the house for cleaning purposes. And then sulfur dioxide, this is, the, uh, this is the gas that is given off when you burn sulfur. So like when you strike a match and you have that burning sulfur smell, that's sulfur dioxide. Okay, so uh, that's just a few of those, and, and um, you know you don't have to memorize those or anything. It's just to show you the, the wide range of possibilities for uh, gases. Okay, so we'll find that there are certain properties that uh, define the state of the gas, and we're going to be looking at those properties. This is what we'll spend most of our time on during this uh, section. And that will include temperature, pressure, volume, and the amount of gas. We will look at how all of those things are related. Uh, but we need to define pressure. We know what temperature is. We've talked about that before. We know what volume and we know what moles are. We, we spent a lot of time in chapters three and four talking about moles. What we really want to get to is the concept of pressure. So when it comes to pressure, pressure is the amount of force that is applied to an area. So it is the force divided by the area. 
atmospheric pressure is the weight of air divided by the uh, unit of area over which that weight is exerted. And just to think about this in sort of practical terms, um, if you were to, on the ground, draw a, a, a square that is one meter by one meter, so one square meter, and then you were to draw an imaginary column of that meter that goes all the way into space, uh, the mass of all of that air that is in that column would be about 10,000 kilograms. So the weight of all of that 10,000 kilograms of air uh, pushing down on that one square meter, that is the atmospheric pressure. And so that, that's quite a bit of pressure. Now, uh, uh, compared to uh, other places in the solar system, we'll find that some of them have greater pressure, some of them have less pressure. It really just depends on what kind of atmosphere they have. But we will find that, uh, that Earth uh, has uh, just the right kind of atmosphere for us, uh, which is good because uh, you know that's where we live. All right, now we want to look at the units of pressure. And um, there are some units that are given on the back of your periodic table, which I'll show to you here in just a moment. Uh, but uh, our official SI unit of pressure is a Pascal. A Pascal is equal to one Newton. A Newton is a unit of force. It's not a very big unit, but it is a unit of force. And uh, that's one Newton per square meter. And again, that is our official SI unit. Turns out that's a pretty small unit, uh, but it is a useful unit to use. A bar, uh, let's see, a bar is equal to 100,000 Pascals. And because a, uh, because a Pascal is such a small unit of pressure, we often use bar when we're talking about the pressure of uh, like our atmosphere. So 100,000 Pascals. You can also put that as 100 kilopascals, which that's a commonly used unit of pressure. All right, so uh, uh, tor, one tor is equal to one millimeter of mercury at zero degrees Celsius. And that has to do with using mercury barometers. There is this uh, picture that is over here on the right side of the screen, and it is a mercury barometer. I will explain how the mercury barometer works here in just a moment, and then I'll come back to this picture after I explain it. But one tor is one millimeter of mercury. We also have the unit that is commonly used in the United States, and that is pounds per square inch. So PSI, uh, uh, and that, like I said, that is a common unit. Uh, for example, the uh, on my car, the, the tire pressure is listed, uh, is supposed to be at about 30 PSI. And it's different for the front than it is for the back. What that means is that the pressure inside the tire is about 30 PSI greater than the pressure at, outside the tire. And that's, that's what we mean by that. All right. Um, in, in terms of that PSI, if you were to do that same thing that we did on that previous page, right? Instead of having one square meter, if you were to do one square inch and take that one square inch and go all the way into space, that one square inch, the mass of the air would be about 14.7 pounds. So that's typical uh, uh, atmospheric pressure is about 14.7 PSI. So atmosphere uh, is the standard unit that's used in this textbook. In this textbook, you will find that in other textbooks, they will use the unit of, ta of bar, uh, but uh, atmosphere is commonly used among chemistry textbooks, so we'll stick with that. So one atmosphere is equal to 760 tor or 760 millimeters of mercury at zero degrees Celsius. Or we can write that in um, commonly used uh, uh, units that are used like on the local weather is in inches of mercury. So one atmosphere is 29.92 inches of mercury. All right. In terms of Pascals, 101,325 Pascals is equal to one atmosphere. And that is an exact definition value. So that is convenient. And then uh, you can put that in kilopascals, 101.325 kPa. There's a couple other units that are, are quite useful. Uh, um, bar, one atmosphere is 1.01325 bar. Again, that is an exact value. 
and uh, and and since bar is more closely related to our SI unit, then that is sometimes a useful thing. You'll sometimes see like the National Weather Service will list the uh, pressure in millibar, in millibar. So, and then as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, one atmosphere is about fourteen point seven, fourteen point six nine six psi. So. Our atmospheric pressure is about one atmosphere, but we're going to find that that depends quite a bit on uh, uh, where you are, what the weather is like, how far above uh, sea level you are. And, uh, and just to demonstrate something, I'm, I'm going to switch over real quickly. So here on this app, um, uh, there's an app I have on my phone that's called Barometer Plus, and you will see that the uh, uh, pressure listed here is 0 0.918 or 981 atmospheres. And the reason it's less than one atmosphere is one, there's you know varying weather conditions, and two, um, if you look down here, you'll see that I live at about uh, a little bit over 600 feet above sea level. And so the higher above sea level you are, the lower that pressure is going to be. Okay, so let's go back. Let's go back over here. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I mean, I'm going to come back to this picture of this barometer here in just a moment. And we want to measure pr uh, pressure with a barometer. The way that a barometer works is that there is a glass tube. That glass tube is sealed on one end and it is open on the other end. So you'll take the open end and you'll fill that completely with mercury. And then you will invert it and put it into a bath of mercury. If that bath of mercury happens to be at zero degrees Celsius and you happen to be at sea level at the right set of conditions, on average, you'll find that the height of that mercury will come out to 760 millimeters uh, uh, from here up to there. The reason that the mercury is like that is that there is a vacuum inside the tube and there is uh, there is a the pressure of the atmosphere outside the tube and the difference in pressure the difference in pressure is what leads to that height of the mercury we will find that the height of the mercury is directly proportional to the atmospheric pressure so you know the higher the pressure is the higher the mercury goes now, it turns out there are less toxic ways to measure pressure now, but uh, mercury barometers were sort of the gold standard for measuring pressure uh, uh, for much of the 19th and 20th century. We've got electronics now that can measure pressure very accurately with uh, no risk of uh, uh, with no risk of being exposed to mercury. For example, the one that you just saw on my phone. All right, before I go to problems number 17 and 20, I do want to go back and look at this mercury barometer. And the reservoir of mercury is down at the bottom. Here is our long tube of mercury. It's closed at the top, and the, and the, uh, the tube is open at the bottom. And you'll see that it is uh, filled. You can't see it here, but it would be filled with mercury. And then you just measure uh, where that mercury rises to. Now, because mercury changes density with temperature, there is a little scale. There, so there is a thermometer that is there, and then there's a little scale that's on the side that you adjust to account for changes in temperature. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a little bit messy. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, having mercury uh, uh, like inside your house is probably not the best idea. And so we've got uh, we've got more modern ways of doing it, but uh, but that is uh, that is how it has been done for most of the time. So now let's look here. Let's look at uh, uh, doing these calculations. We're going to convert from some pressures to some other pressures. Okay, so here. 
Uh, our first question, it says, the typical atmospheric pressure on top of Mount Everest, 29,028 feet, is about 265 torr. Convert this pressure into the following units. Now, I showed you the, uh, um, I showed you some of those conversion factors, but if you look on the back of your periodic table, you will find all the conversions that we need uh, in order to do any of these problems. So we'll start with uh, uh, converting to atmospheres. So we've got uh, 265 torr, and we want to convert that into atmospheres. Well, if we look here, one atmosphere is 760 torr, so we'll multiply by one ATM over 760 torr. And that's it. Cross out the tour and we're good to go. Okay, so we'll do 265 divided by 760, and that will give us uh, 0 0.349, we'll call it. So 0 0.349 atmospheres. So that means if you happen to be at the top of Mount Everest, which I can strongly recommend against, um, if you have a chance to go to the top of Mount Everest, don't. Um, a, a lot of people die going up there or they get injured. Um, it is not a safe thing to do. Uh, uh, some people do it because, you know, they're thrill seekers and stuff like that. But uh, I'm going to recommend um, that you let other people do that. And, and you should do other stuff uh, that doesn't kill you. So, um, but if you happen to go up there, you will find that every breath of air that you take in only has 35% of the normal air uh, that you would have at sea level. And so you're getting 65% less oxygen than you would get at sea level. And this, this is why a lot of people end up dying because that is, that's just not enough oxygen. So it's quite common for people to take uh, oxygen bottles with them. Uh, um, and then a uh, unfortunate uh, thing is a lot of people end up leaving their oxygen bottle, their canisters, uh, just littered on the pathway up to the top of Mount Everest. So again, I am, I'm not a huge fan of uh, climbing these mountains. The first guy who did it, that was really impressive. The second guy, that was cool too. All right, you know, the first hundred people, all right, good for them. But yeah, I mean, you know, we're into many thousands of people who've done it, so... All right, enough about that. 265 tor, we want to convert this into millimeters of mercury. This is hardly even a conversion. Uh, uh, 760 tor is 760 millimeters of mercury. That means one tor is equal to one millimeter of mercury. We don't even need a calculator here, but I'm gonna write it out. One millimeter of mercury is one uh, tor. And of course, tor cancel out, and there we go, 265 millimeters of mercury. Now for Pascal, uh, we'll do 265 tor. And we'll need a conversion between Pascal's and uh, tor. We'll see that 760 tor is equal to 101,325 Pascal's. That is an exact conversion. So 760 tor is 101325 pascals. All right. So I'm going to uh, clear this. I could have left that in there actually. 265 divided by 760. And then we'll multiply that by 101325. And that gives us uh, 35,000. And we have three sig figs. So we'll call it 35,300. Pascals. For bar, we will, uh, yeah, for the bar, this is uh, pretty straightforward. So we'll do 265 tor and then 760 tor down in the denominator, and we'll do 1.01325 Pascals. All right, because uh, uh, not Pascals. <laughs> bar. I want to fix that. So we will put B-A-R. 
All right. So uh, again, uh, one pass one bar is equal to 100,000 pascals. So one atmosphere is 1.01325 bar. All right. So here we'll clear that. Uh, 265 uh, divided by 760. Okay, so we have that same number that we had up there, but now we're going to multiply by 1.01325, and that's going to give us uh, 0.353 bar. So I want you to be comfortable doing these conversions. All right, so let's look at this next one. This one is similar, uh, uh, except here we're looking at uh, we're looking at some other objects in our solar system. We'll start with Titan, is the largest moon of Saturn. Uh, people have not visited this far out in the solar system. Uh, it's uh, it is not practical practical yet, but someday there'll probably be somebody who goes to Titan, and they'll need to know this information about. Uh, just how much the pressure is there. And the atmospheric pressure comes out to 1.47 times 10 to the fifth uh, pascals. That's an average pressure. It varies just like it does on Earth. What is the atmospheric pressure of Titan in atmospheres? All right, so we'll do 1.47 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And then we need to convert between uh, the pascals and atmospheres. Well, a little bit earlier, we saw this 101325 pascals is equal to one atmosphere. So we'll do 1.47 times 10 to the fifth divided by 101325. And that's going to give us our pressure in atmospheres. And you'll see it comes out to 1.45 atmospheres so it just it just so happens if you happen to go to Titan the atmospheric pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure on earth it's got a thicker atmosphere now be warned one it's very cold there and two uh, uh, two uh, essentially none of the atmosphere is oxygen um, and that's there's a, a variety of reasons for that but uh, there, there's no atmosphere, or there's no oxygen in the atmosphere. So you'll need to bring your own oxygen if you are uh, um, looking to go to Titan. All right, uh, here we go. On Venus, uh, um, this uh, I don't think we'll ever have any people land on Venus because the uh, temperatures are too crazy high and it's very, very toxic on the surface. But on Venus, the surface atmospheric pressure is about 90 Earth atmospheres. Wow, 90 atmospheres. Um, what is the Venusian atmospheric pressure in kilopascals? All right, so we'll do 90 atm. And we'll know that one atm is 101,325 pascals. So that's 101.325 kilopascals. All right, it's 101,000. Well, that's 101,000 there. All right, and that's going to give us our answer in kilopascal. So we'll do 90 times 101.325, and that gives us 9119 kPa. However, we need to account for significant figures here. If we look at this number with the way that it's written, it says it's about 90 Earth atmospheres. It really only has one significant figure there. So we're going to round that to uh, 9 times 10 to the third kilopascals. All right, so 9 times 10 to the third kilopascals. Okay, so next thing that we want to look at is we want to go back to our thing here. There's our barometer. Okay. So a manometer is a sort of related to a barometer, but it is a little bit different. The way that a manometer works is that you've got a vessel that is closed 
uh, it's closed off from the atmosphere. So you have some pressure of gas that is in there. And then you've got this tube that is connected to this bend, uh, and the bend has mercury in it. Well, if you want to get the pressure of the gas inside the, inside the vessel here, you can add the atmospheric pressure plus the pressure height difference in the mercury. And so it is a way of measuring the difference in pressure between atmospheric pressure and the pressure inside of a gas vessel. So in this particular example, we've got, uh, we've got some gas, and you'll see that we've got some numbers over here, and it shows the height of the mercury as 136.4 here and 103.8. That makes the height is the difference between those numbers. And then we're going to assume that the atmospheric pressure is 760 uh, uh, unless we were given more information. Of course, if we were doing this in a lab, we would, we would measure that pressure uh, uh, more accurately. But the pressure of the gas inside of this container is going to be atmospheric pressure plus that height. So there is the 760 millimeters. And then here is 136.4 minus 103.8. So it's the difference between those two. And then the number that we end up getting is 792.6 millimeters of mercury. So that is just an example of how you do this. I do not have any uh, problems on the in-class assignment uh, for, for doing this, but uh, it, it is a, a worthwhile thing to look at. All right, so now I want to show a video. And, um, and before I show the video, I'm going to talk about how pressure changes as, atmos as the altitude changes. We'll find that at very high altitude, the air is very thin, and that's because there's, uh, there is less atmosphere between us and space. So there's just not as much air above it to compress, so we have a lower pressure. And you will feel this if you go up a, a very tall hill in a car, or if you if you go up in an airplane, you will find that the pressure uh, changes, and you'll be able to feel that typically in your ears. Um, and if you've got you know if you've got allergies or something, it may be a lot more dis it may be a lot more uncomfortable than if you're uh, if you're feeling uh, in you know perfect health. Um, but there's less air at at higher altitudes. At low altitudes, we'll find that the air pressure is uh, much higher because there's a higher, larger column of air above us compressing it. So let's look at the pressures, and I've got them listed in kilopascals here. So if you happen to be at sea level, the average pressure at sea level comes out to about 101.325 uh, kilopascals. So that's close to 100, so kind of think of it's about 100 at sea level. As you go to higher and higher altitude, um, if you, let's say you go up to 10,000 feet above sea level. Now, uh, just for comparison, Denver is at, it's the mile high city, so it's at about 5,280 feet above sea level. Uh, and so the pressure there is going to be uh, somewhat less than it is at sea level. But let's say we go up to 10,000 feet above sea level. Well, at 10,000 feet above sea level, we'll find that the Average atmospheric pressure comes out to about 69.6. We're going to say that's about 70% of normal atmospheric pressure. That means that every breath of air that you take at 10,000 feet is going to have about 30% less air molecules in it. And so that means 30% less oxygen available to you. And if you go for a uh, hike or a brisk walk, uh, you're probably going to get winded more easily. If you go for a bike ride or something at 10,000 feet, you're going to get more winded uh, uh, more easily, and uh, you, you may find yourself uncomfortable. Uh, if you are in excellent cardiovascular conditioning, uh, you, may, you may do it just fine. You may not notice it very much. But if you, uh, if you are suffering from uh, poor cardio conditioning, you may find that uh, it will be quite uncomfortable. Now, that that is about where most people uh, will get to, and anything above that, they're going to start to feel quite a bit of discomfort. 
Uh, that said, there are people who live at much higher altitudes than 10,000 feet. Uh, there are many cities in Peru that have uh, altitudes of, you know, 18,000 feet. So not, I wouldn't say many. There are some cities. I will just say that. So there are some cities. At 20,000 feet above sea level, which is pretty significant, uh, uh, pretty, pretty high altitude, um, you have less than half of the normal air that is available. So you would be quite uncomfortable if you didn't have uh, extra oxygen available to you. At 30,000 feet, that gets down to about 30% of normal atmospheric pressure. And so that gets uh, very uncomfortable. Um, it would be hard to stay conscious if you were exposed to 30% of our normal atmospheric pressure. And most, uh, most jets, most commercial jets, uh, will fly between 30 and 40,000 feet for maximum uh, efficiency. That's where they will, they will fly. Uh, and in order to do that, they have to pressurize the inside of the cabin so that the passengers uh, don't pass out. You'll notice that whenever you go on a flight, they'll tell you about your seat belts and, you know, and, and where the emergency exits are, all the stuff that you really don't want to ever have to use, uh, but you're glad it's there. Well, one of the things that they will tell you is in the event of an unlikely depressurization of the cabin, uh, uh, a mask will fall down and you take that mask and you put it over your face so that you will have oxygen to breathe. Uh, pure oxygen will flow, and that will keep you from passing out. And, uh, of course, if you lose pressure, you may not want to stay awake. But uh, trust me, it's better to stay awake than it is uh, to pass out. If you stay at that condition, so if you stay at that, you know, less than, you know, less than 30% of normal atmospheric pressure for any length of time, uh, you are likely to start uh, um, having oxygen deprivation, uh, hypoxia, uh, to your brain. And that could, uh, that could lead to brain damage. So, uh, they give you that oxygen. And of course they take that plane and try to get it down to a lower altitude as soon as they can. All right. That is a very rare event, but it is good uh, to know. Um, and you just you won't see the commercial uh, planes flying uh, much higher than about 40,000 feet because it starts to become quite inefficient uh, to do so. You'll see other planes that will go up to higher altitudes. For example, a lot of military jets, and I, I forget which one this is. I think it's an F-16, but I'm not an expert on this. Uh, um, so that particular, or it's either F-16 or F-18, but... Uh, um, that particular plane here is at about 50,000 feet, and that's about uh, how it can uh, uh, easily climb up to those higher altitudes. Uh, there are some military jets. This one is the SR-71. It is no longer used, but it was a, um, it was a U.S. military spy plane that would, uh, that would fly over, uh, um, over the Soviet Union during the Cold War and take pictures of things. And, and they flew over other countries as well. And it went to such a high altitude that the, uh, the anti-aircraft missiles at the time couldn't reach uh, that airplane. So they just sort of flew over and, uh, uh, and you know, nobody could do anything. Of course, uh, if you uh, develop a plane that will go up there, then your opponents will develop a plane that will get up there and uh, try to shoot you down. So. Uh, so it lasted for a little while, but I think by, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, after a while it turned out that, uh, that, that there were other, other ways to get that information by the mid eighties, they started having satellites, so they didn't need, uh, this kind of, uh, airplane, but, uh, up here I've got a weather balloon and you'll see it's up over 100,000 feet and look at the pressure. Uh, less or about 1% of normal atmospheric pressure when you get up to 100,000 feet and anything up over that, uh, the pressure keeps going down. And then over here, you will see a picture. This is a picture of Joseph Kittinger and Joseph Kittinger, uh, um, did a very cool mission, uh, for the air force. And I have a video to show you of Joseph Kittinger doing 
this, doing this mission. Um, the whole thing about where his glove malfunctioned and, uh, and he had a leak. Well, by the time when he got back down to uh, the ground, his hand had swelled up because the, the blood was pooling in his hand. His hand swelled up to about twice its normal size. It must have been very painful. Good news is it was not permanent. It was not permanent. As of uh, this recording, Joseph Kittinger is uh, still alive, still with us. And I don't know if he's still performing, but uh, just a few years back, he was still uh, performing at air shows. So uh, quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, person. So, all right, well, I'm going to, uh, let's see. See, let me look at this real quick. Yeah, before we go to Boyle's Law, we're going to make that part of the second video because uh, the video is getting to a long length here. So, uh, 